Upon graduation with honors from the U.S. Naval Academy, Thomas Stafford was commissioned in the U.S. Air Force so that he could follow his desire to fly faster and higher. He flew fighter interceptors in South Dakota and in Germany before being selected to attend the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School. He graduated first in his class and became an instructor in the school, co-authoring two textbooks for flight tests. In September 1962, he began his NASA career as a member of the second group of astronauts for the Gemini and Apollo programs. He was backup pilot for the first Gemini mission and his first space flight came as pilot on Gemini 6 with Wally Schirra in December 1965. They performed the first ever rendezvous in space. His next flight came just six months later as commander of Gemini 9 with pilot Gene Cernan. Cernan would perform the first spacewalk completely around the world. Gemini 9 would demonstrate three different types of rendezvous, including an early phase rendezvous that would be standard for the lunar missions. As commander of Apollo 10, Stafford would fly the first flight of the lunar module to the moon in May 1969. Unfortunately, it was a heavyweight lunar module and could not land, or he and Cernan could have possibly been the first two men to walk on the moon. They descended in the lunar module to within 10 miles of the surface, radar mapped, photo mapped, and picked out the first lunar landing site. They then performed the first rendezvous around the moon. On their return to Earth, the crew set an all-time speed record of 24,791 miles per hour. After Apollo 10, Stafford replaced Alan Shepard as head of the astronaut office. His final space flight was the Apollo-Soyuz test project in July 1975. It was the first international space flight, rendezvous and docking with the Soviet Soyuz spacecraft. This flight helped open the Iron Curtain with the famous handshake in space and the publicity that followed. It set the template for later shuttle Mir and International Space Station programs. After completion of the Apollo-Soyuz mission, Stafford left his successful career at NASA for his next Air Force assignment as commander of the Air Force Flight Test Center at Edwards Air Force Base. This was a busy time at the Flight Test Center with the testing of the B-1, the A-10, the F-15, and the YF-16, as well as the Air Launch Cruise Missile. During this tour, he was assigned responsibility for overseeing the beginning of tests of a special new classified project named Have Blue, which was the first complete stealth experimental aircraft. This led him to a determination that low observable stealth technology was feasible and could greatly enhance the United States war fighting capability and would change the look of air power forever. He was next promoted to Lieutenant General and assigned as Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff at the Pentagon for research, development, and acquisition. With no statement of need or requirements, he pushed for and started a larger attack stealth aircraft named Senior Trend, which was later designated as the Stealth Attack F-117A. The F-117A flew in just two years and eight months after the contract with Lockheed was signed. This is a modern record from start of contract to flight. The aircraft became operational in less than five years. In Desert Storm, it was the only plane that went downtown Baghdad on opening night of combat in 1991. The F-117A flew less than 2% of the air-to-ground combat missions. However, it was responsible for attacking 38% of the Iraqi strategic targets. When the B-1 bomber was canceled by the Carter administration, Stafford was able to maintain the B-1 program at a minimal level by keeping it alive for testing, even though it had officially been canceled. In his book, Wild Blue Yonder, author Nick Katz stated that General Stafford had helped to revive the B-1 after President Carter canceled it. He further stated that, quote, like Senator John Glenn, Stafford had translated his celebrity as an astronaut into a political power well beyond his military rank. In early 1979, before giving a speech at the Chicago chapter of the Air Force Association, General Stafford met with the chairman of Northrop, whose company had started a low-speed experimental stealth reconnaissance program for DARPA and the U.S. Army, using smooth surfaces. On a piece of hotel stationery, Stafford wrote specifications for range, payload, radar cross-section, and gross takeoff weight, 
for an advanced stealth strategic bomber, the ATB, which later became designated as the B-2. To meet the specifications he had laid out, the aircraft structure was transformed from aluminum to composites. It changed the future of building large airframes by utilizing composite material. The wingspan alone is 172 feet. General Stafford also envisioned a large stealth air superiority fighter to replace the F-15, combining the best technologies of the Lockheed faceted angled design with the Northrop smooth design, and started the fighter roadmap, which became the F-22 Raptor. General Stafford started the competition between Boeing, General Dynamics, and Lockheed to develop a super stealth cruise missile, which became the AGM-129 and over 400 of these units were produced. He put together the concept definitions for a weapons system program that combined an infrared system with a laser designator that would use a high velocity missile that became today's lantern program, which was used by our tactical forces to offset superior numbers of Soviet and Eastern Bloc armored vehicles in low visibility and night conditions. To re-engine the KC-135 tanker fleet, Stafford argued for and won the debate for the high bypass CFM 56 engine, now designated the F 108. The CFM 56 engine has become the most successful commercial jet engine with over 20,000 produced to date. Stafford then pushed for and started the F 110 engine as a joint Air Force Navy re engine for the F 14s and later the F 16s and potentially the F 15s. Even later, with a larger fan, the F-110 was designated as the F-118. It was used to power the B-2 bomber and re-engined the TR-1. Announcing his retirement from the Air Force in late 1979, Stafford was immediately contacted by his friend, Governor Ronald Reagan, to help on the Air Force portion of his DOD advisory team for the 1980 presidential election. After the election, he served as a key member of the Reagan DOD transition team, providing a large portion of the proposed Air Force structure and rationale for the data book turned over to Casper Weinberger, who became the new Secretary of Defense. In these data facts, General Stafford recommended increasing the Air Force tanker structure from 20 KC-10s to 60 KC-10s, which was achieved. He also recommended 244 B-1 bombers which was the original baseline for the Ford administration, and 132 ATB B-2s. To enhance the airlift capabilities, Stafford recommended that 50 C-5Bs and 120 AMST, which became the C-17s, be built. He also recommended increasing the production rate for the F-15 and F-16 lines to a significant level after they had been drastically reduced by the Carter administration. Another important recommendation was that the Reagan administration deploy 100 MX Peacekeeper missiles to replace a portion of the Minuteman 3s. He also recommended increasing the total active duty, guard, and reserve to 40 tactical fighter wings. Another recommendation was that the war reserve supplies be brought up to the level whereby the Air Force could adequately engage on two conflicts simultaneously, one in Europe and one in Asia. In 1990, President George H.W. Bush and Vice President Dan Quayle asked General Stafford to put together a committee to conduct a study to carry out President Bush's space exploration initiative for the U.S. to return to the moon and eventually an expedition to Mars. This committee was named the Synthesis Group. Stafford chaired this group of 45 full-time and 150 part-time staff with inputs from NASA, DOD, DOE, every appropriate industrial firm, as well as input from all academia in America. After 11 months effort, Vice President Quayle and General Stafford conducted a White House joint press conference to unveil the study named America at the Threshold. This study is still regarded as the Bible for space exploration beyond low Earth orbit. One of the architectures in the study became the blueprint for the recently canceled Constellation Space Exploration Program. During the early 1990s, when a major problem developed on the long-awaited Hubble Space Telescope, the NASA Administrator asked General Stafford to form and chair a committee to oversee NASA in its effort to save the Hubble. The intense effort carried out using the directions recommended by General Stafford's group was a success and became the standard technique 
for subsequent Hubble servicing and repair missions. In June 1992, President George H.W. Bush and Russian President Boris Yeltsin agreed on a joint shuttle Mir Russian space station program. One month prior to that agreement, Stafford and NASA's George Abbey approached Dan Golden just three days after he was named acting NASA Administrator and convinced him that the U.S. should work with Russia to have the Soyuz as a crew escape vehicle on the International Space Station. Because of his Apollo-Soyuz experience, General Stafford was asked by the administration to form and chair an oversight committee for shuttle Mir missions as a prelude to the International Space Station. He would be joined by a select group of Russian experts, and that continues today for the International Space Station and is known as the ISS Advisory Committee. In 2003, after the tragic Columbia accident, General Stafford was again asked to form and chair a task group to ensure that the 15 recommendations of the Columbia Accident Review Board were carried out and presented to the administration before the shuttle would be returned to flight. That was successfully accomplished after two years and there were no further accidents through to the end of the shuttle program in 2011. Today, a lot of the Air Force inventory was a result of General Stafford's work and his influence in the Reagan administration and the Congress. In his career, he has flown 126 different type of aircraft, including helicopters, and four different types of spacecraft. Whether it's in the air or in space, General Thomas Stafford will have a lasting influence in both of these fields of endeavor.